Amen. Where'd my... Oh, no. I lost my, my uh, cup. <laughs> Better not spill it, or else Adam's going to kill me for getting water on the pulpit. So uh, turn with me, if you will, to uh, Judges chapter 4 this morning. Um, I've got this great... What do you call those things? Coaster. Coaster. Thank you. Wow. I just, I'm an idiot. Uh, it keeps the water from getting on the pulpit because the, the Barkers got so nervous about me keeping water up here. They're like, they're gonna, he's going to ruin that pulpit. And so they were so sweet to give me this awesome coaster that has the 95 theses on it. That's what's so cool. It's awesome. So uh, I love it. My, you guys are all so great to me, and I just really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for even recognizing my stupidity of spilling water as well because I definitely do stuff like that all of the time. Uh, it's hard to sing that hymn and, and, and not sing thee and thy in place of you and your because I learned it with that and it just it, it's hard but man what a great hymn. I just love that hymn so much. If you are a student of church history you'll know that throughout all of church history, it seems to be a lot of overreaction that happens uh, throughout history. That, that there was a heresy that came into the church very early on. It was called Arianism. And that was, was a false teaching that, that, that said that, that the... Um, uh-oh. <laughs> um, clean up on aisle one. Um, we, uh, we, it's, a, it's a teaching that talks about um, that Jesus was not God. He's not fully God, but he was the first and greatest of the created beings. Um, and so because of that, uh, uh, it, it was a heresy that infected the church. Well, there was an overreaction that happened to that, where it, after that great heresy inflicted the church, there was this sort of this overreaction that said that Jesus is all God and he's not man. And so, and so we have this tendency in the church to, to sort of to sway to one ditch or the other, to go from one side to the other, that, that, that as God has called us to walk down this particular straight path of correct doctrine and correct teaching, that sometimes we have tendency to fall over on this ditch over here, or we have a tendency to overcorrect and then fall into this ditch over here. And so we see that throughout the scriptures. Some modern examples would be things like, um, you know, there's the word of faith movement, right? Which is heresy. It's heresy. This name it, claim it. If I have enough faith, I can do all these things. Um, and this heresy that has infected the church. Well, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, we sort of have a tendency to overcorrect correct and not pray expecting great movements of God or great things from God or having faith that he might move mountains or do wonderful things in that way. That we have a tendency to almost then put handcuffs on God and not pray expecting great things to come. Not presumptuously, not presuming on grace or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. But we have a tendency to overcorrect on that and then we don't expect God to do great things. Uh, I think about how we overcorrect correct when we talk about money you know you guys have been in churches where where the pastors and stuff they're they're basically trying to fleece the flock in order to build their next building program and and things along those lines and what do we do we overcorrect where we don't talk about money at all because we don't want to offend people or make it sound like we're one of those fleecing churches or something like that well the scripture actually has a lot to say about money and we need to pay attention to what it has to say I think a, a more modern one, or at least in the last 400 years or so, has been an overcorrection with regard to um, the mother of Jesus Christ, Mary. How, how the Catholics elevate Mary to a place of worship where they will bow down and offer prayers to her and call her the queen of the universe and all this sort of thing. And so Protestants freak out about that and they're like, whoa, ho, ho, ho. you know, Mary's just a woman, you know, and of course she's just a woman. But she is also the Theotokos, you know, she is the Christ bearer. Um, uh, she was called blessed among women. And we ought not to d diminish the role that Mary played. She was a wonderful woman of God, used mightily by God, and every woman would do well to follow in Mary's footsteps as a, as a picture of obedience and devotion to Christ and all of these things. That we have these tendencies to overreact about things. Well, 
this morning's message can be potentially controversial in the world in which we live because now we have this great fight within the church about the feministic influence of the church. And I would argue over the last probably about 150 years, we've seen an increase in feminism in the church. And I'm not talking about femininity. I'm talking about feminism. Okay, that 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 battle that goes all the way back to the garden, all the way back to Genesis chapter three, where it talks about that, that your husband will rule over you, but you will your desire will be for your husband and this conflict that happens among the sexes. And, and, and the great rebellion of men is that they have a tendency to become more feminine in their rebellion by being lazy or complacent or, or sitting back and letting somebody else take charge or something like that. So the, the rebellion of men is to become more feminine in their uh, disposition. And the rebellion of women is to become more masculine. To want to jump in, to want to come in and take charge, to want in to come in and take control. And so because of this conflict that happens, and because there is a notable um, understanding that feminism, not femininity, okay, we're gonna I'm gonna keep qualifying that as we go, has infected the church. Well, what does the church do? It has a tendency to really overreact against that. So now it's women sit down, shut up, manosphere, you know, nonsense kind of stuff that comes into the church. And it's sort of like this beating down of women because they're too afraid of one of being called feminist or something along those lines. And so I say all that to say this morning, um, we're going to need to take off our modern Western glasses as we read the scripture today. Because on one side, you see all the feminists saying, ah, Deborah, the prophetess, the judge. See, women can be pastors. Women can be all of these different things, elders and things, because of an exception that we have given in scripture. And then you have the men are the manosphere type people, the overcorrection people saying, oh, Deborah's nothing. It's all about Barak. It's all about Barak. It's not Deborah. It's Barak. And so we see this, that if we don't look at the scripture for what it actually has to say to us, we may have a tendency to want to read it and eisegete into the text what we would want it to say rather than just letting the text speak for itself. So pray for me. Because I also have presuppositions, and I also have problems with myself, and I also have areas where I need to be, um, uh, uh, um, cons- or what's the word I'm looking for here, shaped into a better Christian and an understanding biblically from the scriptures, okay? So we're going to look at all of these things this morning. It's going to be a real, it, the passage itself is fantastic, This is an amazing passage where God used two women mightily and awesomely for his glory in an era where men are being wussified, not stepping up to the task, not being who they have been called to be. And so what happens? Some women God uses to step in and shame the men, so to speak. That's what we're going to see from the scriptures this morning. But it does not discount the fact that these women in this passage were good Godly, awesome women used mightily by God for his glory. So stand with me this morning as we look at Judges chapter 4 um, and we look at the Barak and Deborah, or Deborah and Barak, or however you want to put it, okay? Uh, we're gonna, it's an interesting passage of scripture and it's controversial, but I don't think it needs to be. Verse 1, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who raised and, uh, reigned in Hazor. Uh, the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel at that time. So she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, go. 
Gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. <laughs> and verse 9, And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the, Lord, the, the, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak or Barak, I'm going, to go, I'm going to say it back and forth, I guarantee you, called out Zebulun and Naphtali, Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, the Kenite, had separated himself, or had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pictured his tent, pitched his tent, wow, as far away as the oak of Za'anaim. Uh, when Sisera told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, and from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left." But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Canaanite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent. And if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. And she went softly to him and drove the peg into the temple until he went, it went down into the ground while he was laying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. And he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead, with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day God subdued Jabin, the, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the, the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. This is the word of the Lord, given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Please receive it with the weight and authority that it carries, because this is the word of God. You may be seated. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon this time. Our Heavenly Father, it is our prayer this morning that your word would be illuminated and that we would receive it with joy, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would give me the grace and the ability to be able to preach the word faithfully this morning, that I would not do any damage to the text or insert any of my own opinions on things, but, Lord, I would just preach the word as it is and that we would receive it as preached, Lord. I pray that as the word of God is proclaimed, that you would convict us all of sin and righteousness and of judgment, bring about uh, changed hearts and changed minds this morning from the proclamation of the word of God. And Lord, I pray that in everything that we do this morning, you would be glorified in all things. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Thank you all. Uh, I, this is going to be one of those mornings, I think, where I'm going to trip over all of my words. So just bear with me. I guess it's just one of those things this morning. It happens like that from time to time. This whole passage of Scripture is fantastic. In fact, we're only getting the uh, worldly understanding of it this week. Next week, we'll talk about the uh, sort of the uh, interpretive song, the, the great uh, declaration uh, from almost from, a, from God's perspective or, or give it a better picture of an interpretation of this passage next week when we get to Judges chapter 5. But it was just too much for one thing. It's really cool because if you look at some passages of Scripture, you see this happen. You see that in the book of Jonah, it's one of the greatest examples, you have all of chapter 1 and, and you know, God says to Jonah, get up, go to Nineveh, go preach against that great city, the proclamation that I'm going to give you to preach. And, and, and Jonah got up indeed, and he went the exact opposite way, running from the Lord to the point where God had to have a great fish swallow him up. And we get, that's just an interesting story, okay? But then we get Jonah chapter 2, where we have this song, this poem, this, this sort of interpretation of the events of chapter 1 that's given to us. And so that's what we're going to see next week, or maybe the week after. I haven't yet decided whether I'm continuing this for next week, or we might have, I might jump to a different passage for Easter Sunday. I've not decided yet. So come next Sunday, and you'll never know what's going to happen. So, uh, But we see in chapter 5, is like this, this poem. This, this song, this interpretation of what's happening in chapter 4. So we'll go through it, and then we'll kind of go through it again when we get to Judges chapter 5 and get the full picture of all that's happening. Remember also we saw this happen with the people of Israel Going through the Red Sea, that in, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 14 is that great, that great uh, event of them going through the Red Sea. And what do we see in Exodus chapter 15? The song of Moses, horse and rider, he is thrown into the sea, the great victory that he has accomplished. And so we'll see that. And it's really, really cool. So continuing on, we've already talked about Othniel as the first judge. We've talked about Ehud, who is the second judge, that, that under Ehud, that, that they had the greatest time of peace. The greatest time. It was double that of anybody else. It was 80 years as opposed to 40 or below for many of the other judges. But because of this statement in verse 1, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So for 80 years they had peace, they had relative um, you know, uh, uh, faithfulness to the Lord. I know that they weren't completely faithful and I'm not even making that assumption, but I'm saying relative faithfulness at least to the point where there was peace in the land. But then Ehud died. Okay. What a sad state of affairs that our walk with the Lord may be based upon somebody else's leadership. That we ought to be careful about not linking ourselves too strongly to somebody else and looking to them for our spiritual walk with the Lord. We are here as elders. We have resources through Ligonier, through Canon Press, through all these various outlets and resources that have been given to us, G3 Ministries, things like that, where we have been get granted opportunities for help in our spiritual walk, in our discipleship. But we mustn't hang all of our spiritual walk and all of our discipleship on any man, you see. That we ought not to do it upon any woman. That we have been called to walk with the Lord regardless of the leadership that has been given. And as we saw this, after Ehud died, they went right back to the same thing they were doing before. It was a shallow spirituality, so to speak, a shallow faithfulness to the Lord, that as soon as the great leader died, they went right back to where they were before. So it says, as I mentioned last week, it does mention the same thing, that this word again doesn't just mean again, it could also mean increase. So this idea that they increase, not only did they go back to old patterns, but they increased in their rebellion against God and further sinfulness against Him. So because of this, because of this going back, this languishing back to old patterns, which by the way is another uh, uh, reminder to us how we ought to be vigilant to go to to repent and turn away from sin in our lives and it shouldn't be just a flash in the pan sort of uh crocodile tears i'm sorry that i did this thing that we then go back to again and again and again 
That was, as we walk in repentance, we need to walk in actual repentance, forsaking the things in our life that would draw us back to that same place of sinfulness. I think of Zacchaeus, how we see a great picture of Zacchaeus, how he is declaring and, and, and practicing the repentance of following after Christ. If I've defrauded anybody, I'll return it back to him fourfold, he says. It's a picture of his repentance, of his restitution that he gave for anything that he had done. He demonstrated, let, we see it throughout scripture, let him who stole steal no more. Rather, let him work. We see these in Scripture. Simple obediences, simple repentances, but effective in the sense of turn away from that thing and don't go back to it. Don't allow yourself to be drawn back to that. But we don't see this. We see a sort of flippant obedience that as soon as this man of God dies, they go right back to the same old patterns again. And so then the Lord sells them in, into now the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the commander of his army with Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. And then the people cry, of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. So we see the same judge formula, don't we? That they again return back uh, to, the, to, the, to doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Therefore, God raises up an oppressor. And this oppressor has been brought in in order to bring the people under submission so that they might cry out to God again in repentance for the sake of him keeping covenant with his people, bringing the chastisement so that they might bring the people back. And so by allowing this to happen, the people are then going to to again cry out to the Lord, the same judge formula. This time it was at the hand of this guy by the name of Jabin, or probably Yabin, and the Hebrew is probably closer, king of Canaan who reigned in Hazor. Now, if you're a student of the scriptures and you see this word Hazor that's being used here back in the book of Joshua, Hazor was actually raised to the ground and set on fire. So we, there are, there's a whole big kerfuffle about what's going on here. Is this passage here talking about that time or is this some future time about a hundred years later? I have a tendency to think that this is a future time a hundred years later, but it's also a picture of how quickly the, the sin in the land and the people got back to power. Like in a hundred years, we see this Hazor that was raised and burned and all of these things now being built back up. And this king now has been able to come and take power over the people of Israel. To me, that says less about the ingenuity of this King Jabin and all of these Canaanites. And it says more about the providence of God. That he brought them up for the express purpose of bringing this oppression against his people. So that way he may demonstrate his faithfulness and bring them to repentance. We talked about this last week. The buffoon king, right? That guy who was brought up and who was, who, Eglon, who, uh, uh, of the, um, the Moabites, uh, or was it Ammonites? It's Moabites, Ammonites, and Amalekites, and I think he was Moabites. <laughs> uh, and, and, so, and so this buffoon king, this person was raised up by God in order to bring judgment. A reminder of the fact that God is the one who is the king of all the kings on the earth, and he sets kings, he raises the power, he brings them down according to his providential hand. And so he allows this Hazor king to come up again in the span of about a hundred years probably, and then come and be an oppressor against the people of Israel. So we see, we see this, uh, uh, this same formula happening again. By the way... Robert Godfrey would be very happy to know that all of chapter 4 is a beautiful and awesome chiasm. It's a great chiastic structure here. And so we see in this chiastic structure of, of Judges, we're going to see this as it goes. Uh, the first is the sons of Israel oppressed. That's what we see that we just read from verses 1 through 3. But the next we're going to see Deborah the prophetess announced, so to speak, that she's going to be raised up here. We're going to see. We're going to see that Barak and Sisera are called out okay, to war that the Lord, Yahweh, 
is the warrior. That's the heights of the chiasm. The focus is on God, the warrior, who has appointed these things. And then back down the chiasm, we see Barak and Sisera go down. We see Jael, the wife of Heber, which is parallel with the Deborah passage, okay? And then last leading with Jabin, the king of Canaan, subdued. So it begins with the oppression of Israel. It ends with the oppression of Jabin. You see? We see this happening. In between here, we see Deborah uh, juxtaposed with Jael. We see Barak and Sisera juxtaposed with Barak and Sisera. And at the very top, who is the pinnacle? Who is in control of all of this? Who's the warrior? The Lord our God. Amen. Okay? And so all of this has to do with him. So as we look of all of this, the raising and lowering, the oppressing and the deliverance, as we see even those who are put into power and how the deliverance comes, it's all because of our Lord God, all because of the great deliverance of God. He is the pinnacle. He is the warrior. He is the one who brings the uh, uh, release for his people from the oppression. So, verse 4 through 9. Now Deborah... A prophetess. And we're getting into the story now. So that was just the introduction, right? They again went against the Lord. He brings an oppressor. The people cry out to God. Same formula. Now we're getting into the meat and potatoes of the text, so to speak. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel at that time. And she used to sit under the palm of Deborah... Hey, look at that. She had a palm named after her because I guess she sat there all the time. Uh, and everybody knew it was called the Palm of Deborah after this time, as Samuel's writing this down, most likely. Uh, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Hazel, Mount Tabor, taking ten thousand from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kashan, and his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road to which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Okay, so let's stop there. I know that there's another verse there that sort of uh, uh, it sort of ends the paragraph, but I think I want to put that with the next section of Barak and Sisera. So we see Deborah, the prophetess. Deborah is not the only prophetess that's mentioned in the scriptures. In fact, there are several others. One in particular is Miriam, the sister of Moses, who led the women in singing the song of Moses. And as she went out with a tambourine and taught them all the songs, she led the women. And they prophesied in the sense of the utterances of God, the praising of God, glory to his name. We also see a prophetess by the name of Huldah, who is a prophetess during the time of Josiah at the end of 2 Kings. It's like 25 or something along those lines. And they find the book of the law, and she makes a proclamation basically saying that, well, Josiah, you're a good king, and, and God, God's proud of your faithfulness. But because of Manasseh and because of the wickedness that the nation has absolutely committed, you're done. You're gone. I'm bringing Babylon, and they're going to destroy you all. We also see, I think, Elizabeth, the wife of um, uh, Zechariah, the mother of John the Baptist, acting in the manner of a prophetess as she greets uh, uh, Mary. And that's where that great, that great uh, um, uh, utterance that says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. A great declaration of that coming in the, in the means of a prophetess doing that. I think that Mary herself then utters prophecy where she says the Magnificat, that beautiful passage of scripture, ascribing glory to God for the things that he has done for her. And I think then we also see Anna, who is a prophetess, I think, as she's meeting the Christ child in the temple, the one who is like... Um, uh, uh, 
widow from like 80 years ago or something. She's just in the temple day and night waiting for the coming of the Messiah, waiting for the Messiah to be revealed. And when she meets Christ, she says, now your servant can go home in peace, basically, that she can she can die because God has shown himself faithful to her after she waited all of those years. So there have been times in the scripture where God has used women in prophetic ways and in prophetic utterances. But what's also interesting here is that she says that Deborah, the prophetess, was judging Israel at that time. And she's actually by, she's under this palm, which is called the palm of Deborah, where she, their people are going out to her for judgments. They're going to seek her as a prophetess. So we can't sit here and not acknowledge the fact that she's definitely a prophetess. And she's definitely, I'm going to say this very, very specifically, acting in the role of a judge in this time okay that is true and she by also i would like to say that it mentions that she's the wife of a husband that i think that she is operating under a normal you know husband wife uh marriage in the way that god has made in scripture and we see that she is she is she is faithful in all of these things and mightily used by god and she's to be lauded and she's to be exalted as a, a faithful woman of God, a woman whom all women, I think, should emulate in the sense that she is faithfully performing her office that God has granted her to perform. And she's doing these things. However, I think the problem is, is that she is doing these things, but she wasn't supposed to be the one doing these things. Okay, She being raised was God's faithfulness to the people in the midst of great un faithfulness that they have been committed because i think the one who's supposed to be the judge here is barack even though deborah is acting as judge here the person whom god has appointed as judge here is barack there are two main passages of scripture outside of this passage that i think give us a clue into that understanding one is first samuel chapter 12 verse 11 it's an utterance about, uh, from Samuel, and he's talking about Israel's history. And when he goes through and he names the judges, he says this. He says, And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel to deliver you out of the hands of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. It's not that Samuel is sitting here denouncing Deborah. It's not that he's sitting here like saying that Deborah was wrong for what she was doing. Obviously, God has raised her up for a specific purpose, but he did so because the people of Israel were under judgment. And because the one who was supposed to be judge, Barak, was not fulfilling his duties. If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, it says, and what, remember that Hebrews 11 is that great hall of faith talking about Abraham and, and, and Moses and Noah. And, and he talks about all these prophets and all of these things and he's going through and he starts to mention the judges. And what does he say? And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David and Samuel and the prophets. And he goes on to name Barak as well as the judge during this time. Once again, what I'm not saying is that there's any problem or conflict or anything like that. And that Deborah should not be, you know, uh, uh, seen as a wonderful example of godliness in all of these things. What I am saying is that God has reserved that level of leadership for men. And that's what he, is, he has done according to how he has defined the roles for men and roles for women, just like men are supposed to be eldership and teaching theology and all of these things like that. That, that. That's been the case, and it's always been the case. So we see here, though, in circumstances, or at least put it this way, in exceptions to the rules of things that God raises up Deborah because the man won't do the work, so to speak. The one who has been granted that judgment. And so this speaks to the faithfulness of Deborah. And it mean, it's, it's mean to be, I think it's meant to be a little bit of a judgment against Barak. And so we see this uh, because we see in verse 6, Then she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go 
Gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to greet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. So in other words, uh, Deborah's calling him out. In a prophetic way, she's acting in the role of a prophet in the sense that that she's prescribing to him the word of God. Hasn't God said this? God has told you to do this. So go do it. Go do it. And so she's got to uh, uh, like sort of lift him up and build him up and send him out because he's still not rising to the occasion that he's supposed to be doing. He's not rising to the occasion. Once again, Deborah's being faithful Barak is not, okay? Deborah's being faithful. Barak is not. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go out. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. (laughs) And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you were going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of the woman. Then Deborah arose and went to Barak, uh, with Barak to Kadesh. I entitled this sermon, The Strength of Godly Women, because I truly believe in that title. And I think that um, we have in Deborah and, and, and many of the other women that we see in Scripture, I think of, of Priscilla. Uh, partnering with Aquila and all of the missionary endeavors that they were doing. I thought last week we talked about Phoebe from from Romans uh, chapter 16. Uh, We see people like Lydia. Um, We see the women in the time of Jesus, all those women who housed Jesus and prepared meals for him and took care of him and, and supported him along the way as an itinerant preacher. Women have incredible and wonderful and amazing contributions to the kingdom of God. For the glory of God, according to how God has created them, just as he does, has done with, with men. And so we see that, and I think we see that here. And I think that one of the greatest ways in which, and all the men who are married better amen really loudly on this part, you know, is that how much more and how great and how much more uh, 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 secure we are in ourselves, knowing that we have our wives by our side supporting us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let it be known, those in the back who can't hear this microphone, Bill, amen the loudest, Amy. So just so you know. Um, because, look, I remember, you know, I, 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 there's a part of me that was like a, a, a young buck, sort of like ready to charge hell with a water pistol sort of guy hitting the, uh, the streets of Memphis and preaching the gospel. But man, when I married Katie... Then I felt like I could take on the whole stinking world, man. Like, 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 she makes me a better man. And those of you who have wives of quality, which I hope is all of you, and I'm not tearing anyone down this morning, okay? You are better men because of your wives. You are better. You can accomplish more for the kingdom of God. That this wonderful partnership that God has created with men and women in a marriage, that if I did not have the support of Katie, and if I didn't have her building me up and constantly encouraging me and being the wife to me that I need her to be, I am less than half of the man that I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that we see this right here in the text, don't we? Barack can't get it together. (laughs) He can't. He's a wuss. He's not getting up. He's not getting the job done. He's not doing what God told him to do. So what does Deborah have to do? She's got to help him out. Get up, Barack. God said, go out there and fight them. Mm -hmm. Praise God for women like that. Praise Praise God for women who stand and they will not be moved. And to stand scripturally sound and, 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 and inspire us to go be the men that we're supposed to be. I think you see a beautiful and wonderful picture of that complementarian relationship between men and women in the scripture. That men, they just, they need their wives. They need their wives to come alongside them, to build them up, to, to encourage them. So that way we can continue to do with the things that we have been called to do. That's why you see converse things in the scripture, like in the Proverbs. You know, better it is to hide on the corner of a rooftop than it is to dwell with a contentious woman. Because the opposite is true as well. 
The backbiting, the tearing down, the discouragement that may come from a wife, the, the complaining, boy, that beats us up. It hurts, and that makes me feel like less of a man. That you have no idea, women, wives, the influence that you have on your husbands for good or for evil. And just the same way, men, you have no idea. We ought to be loving our wives as Christ loved the church. We have been called to sacrifice ourselves for our wives, to provide for our wives, to lead our wives. We've been called to do all this. And so what do you see? That beautiful harmony that God put together between men and women, between husbands and wives. That either one could destroy the other in an instant. And just as much as, as a woman wants to be treated with the love and the gentleness and the care and the respect and the admiration of her husband, a man needs to be know, know that he's respected and built up and he knows that you've got his back. And it goes both ways. And we need to both be uh, um, fulfilling the roles that God has called us to be in our marriages and in life. And so we see this wonderful picture. This godly woman, under the authority of God, calling out Barak. But he needed to be called out and it took a woman to do so. And praise God that she did. In faithfulness to the Lord. And so Barak says, look at how Barak needs her too. <laughs> if you go with me, I'll go. <laughs> I love that so much. I love it. But I really do need that too. I'm, I can't look at this and not think of my own marriage and think about, are you coming? Because I'm not going if you're not coming, you know? We, and my wife and I always have this joke that we say to each other constantly. It says, don't you ever leave me because if you do, I'm coming with you. <laughs> I'm following after you. Not giving up. Continuing on. And so we this great, I think we see just a beautiful picture of how God uses mighty, godly woman for the sake of his kingdom. Verse 10. So we see a, a calling out. Barak and Sisera calling out here. Verse 10. Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali, Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up as, at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab. Uh, well, that's a great name, by the way, Hobab. Uh, the father-in-law of Moses, and he pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zaananim. <laughs> I think I said it better that time, which is near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Harasheth Hagoyim up to the river Kishon. Now, this is probably happening in the northern area of the, 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 the nation of Israel, probably close to the Galilean Sea, probably sort of northwest of it, okay? And as, when you go up there, there are a lot of these things that are called, uh, there are plains and there are what are called wadis. Do you know what a wadi is? It's a river that doesn't have water in it. It's an area, a stream, a river that dries up constantly during arid times. But if they get enough rain, then there's going to be uh, uh, creeks and streams and rivers that flow through there. So this is where they find themselves. So we see Barak now calling out his troops, his people, and all of these. And then we see uh, 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 Barak and Sisera calling out his people, his troops, and now they're all going to meet in this area for battle. Okay? It's important to know the geography here, and I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to give you a foretaste of a little thing that uh, chapter 5 speaks about, uh, because I think we're going to see that not only is God um, uh, providentially preparing all of these things as we go here, but you're going to see that this providential deliverance is actually quite literal happening as we go here. It's very awesome stuff, and it gets me really pumped to see this, because we see them all coming out to meet them. But notice this one little, like, sort of aside. Uh, in verse 11, it says, Now Heber, the Kenite, uh, had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Za'ananim, which is near Kadesh. What in the world is that verse doing there? It, it sort of breaks the flow of all that's happening. Well, we know that there's no verses in Scripture that does not have importance or significance. What we're getting here is a beautiful writing uh, uh, style that's giving us a small foretaste of something really cool that's going to come, something very interesting that's going to happen. But it's also giving us a history lesson. 
Hobab is another name for Jethro, who is another name for Remuel, or Ra- Raul. How do you say it? Ruel, Ruel, thank you. I lost it for a second there. Ruel, which is the father in law of Moses. Moses married his daughter. And so, and so uh, what was, as they were coming back through um, the, the, the wilderness on their way to the promised land coming out of Egypt, basically they're saying, you guys need to come with us. Come with us. And finally they were persuaded. And so the Kenite clans came with them into the land of, of Israel. Okay. And so, but we see here a defection. Okay, that's what's being set up here. There's a defection from these faithful Kenites where Heber the Kenite had separated himself. So he's separated from the people of Israel and he's now aligned himself with Jabin, uh, 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 the the king of Canaan here. See, okay, so so we see him separating and uh, and adjoining a a, a, a building an alliance there with them. So they were part of the people of God. And then they've joined the enemy, so to speak. Okay? I'm sure there's a great application that I can make there, but I need to move on. So, um, <clears throat> so, so we see there, they're all going down. Um, 900 chariots of iron, it says in verse 13. That's an important little tidbit, too, because the thing about chariots of iron is they happen to be very heavy. And if you have heavy vehicles, uh, then you need something to support those heavy vehicles. And that's all great and good as long as you're going on these dry wadi beds and these dry plains, then those chariots operate really, really well and they're really destructive and there's, you're not going to beat them. You're not going to beat 900 chariots of iron unless, unless a mighty work of God happens. Verse 14, which is the pinnacle verse of this entire passage. This is the height of that chiastic structure. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given you our Sisera into your hand. Now I love this. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from the Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. Does not the Lord go out before you? If you guys remember a passage of Scripture... Um, it's in First Kings, around 17, 18, 19, around that time. The great, the great moments of time whenever Elisha, uh, not Elisha, Elijah has that standoff with the prophets of, of Baal um, on Mount Carmel. Um, how all the prophets of Baal were humiliated and then killed because of, because of what happened there. That, that at that time there was a great famine and drought that was happening upon the land because they had turned from worshiping the one true God to turning to Baal for worship. Because there was this old Baal epithet that says, build Baal his temple and he will send the rain. Okay? And so they turned from the one true God to false gods expecting to get the rain because of that. So when they cried out, which is really fun because it sounds like they were saying, Elijah, 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 because Elijah's name means the Lord is God. So they all cried out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. It says that after that, there was a, there was a, they went up to this uh, cliff kind of overlooking the sea and they started to see a cloud develop. And it said in the scripture that the cloud looked like a hand. And they began bigger and bigger and bigger. And there was this great race to go to the king to say, the rain is coming. The rain is coming. And so think about this. The hand of the Lord went out and brought the rain. I think this is the same thing that we see right here. I think whenever Deborah says, does not the Lord go out before you? I think what they see happening, once again, I'm cheating because we're going to go to chapter 5, either next week or the week after, that there was a great thunderstorm that came over the land. And they understood, this is the hand of the Lord. They saw the providential movement of God. And what happened with that torrential rainfall and that thunderstorm? All those wadis started filling up. And all that land that was dry just, you know, a day before was now muddy and sloppy and all that stuff. And what can you do with iron chariots and muddy, sloppy uh, land? You can't run them. 
And so that was the deliverance of God that brought, that he brought there by sending the rain, flooding the area, sinking the iron chariots, and then now Barak comes down, and now they're able to have the victory. But who brought the victory? The Lord brought the victory. And so up this day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Awesome, awesome passage. And I can't wait to get to it in chapter 5 also. Verse 15, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all the army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. Why? Why did he get down? Because his chariot was sunk in the mud. And so he gets out on foot and Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. It was a great and tremendous and overwhelming victory that God had brought in order to deliver his people from these oppressors. Now we get to the second mighty and awesome woman that is given to us in this scripture. So we see Deborah paralleled with this woman by the name of J.L. Well, J.L. or Yael is literally Elijah reversed. Eliyah, okay, the Lord is God. This one is Yael, the Lord. In fact, in this, the Hebrew is emphasized. It's in Hebrew, they speak like Yoda, okay? Uh, uh, Bereshith bara, in the beginning, he created Elohim, namely God. So the, the subject always comes after the verb in Hebrew, except when they want to emphasize something. So Eliyah, God is the Lord, okay? The Lord comes second. But in, in this one, what they're saying is it, it's, it's an emphatic statement. So this JL is, is coming from an Israelite understanding. She's coming from the Hebrew people. This is her being devoted to the Lord before they separated and joined with Jabin, you see? So we see the faithfulness here of Yahel, the Lord, He is God, you see? And so J.L. Uh, is where we're coming up. Verse 17, But Sisera uh, fled away on foot to the tent of J.L., the wife of Heber, the Canaanite. Or the Canaanite. Uh, for there was peace between Job and the king of Hazor and the house of Heber, the Canaanite. So now we see the reason why. Okay, That's why we had that verse before, is to show that this is a household that has allied itself to the enemy, so to speak. But we see a faithfulness even in the midst of that. Uh, because women... <laughs> Sometimes your husbands are stupid, <laughs> and they do stupid things. And sometimes, even though we, we don't need to be, you know, so to speak, like, you know, constantly ripped down or anything like that, but we need your help, too, to keep ourselves from doing really dumb things. And I think what we see here is one of those great pictures of, of just the same way as, as the uh, devotion or the obedience of children to parents um, is not absolute, because if a parent leads a child or tells a child to do something that goes against the law of God, that child ought to obey God over his parents. If the government passes a law and says, you must all do these things, but that law goes against God's law, we have a duty and obligation to not pay attention to that law in order to follow the law of God instead. And let me say this, obedience to your husbands, ladies, only goes so far. You have not been called to obey everything that your husband does if he is not doing what the law has commanded. If what he is telling you to do goes against what the word of God says, you listen to God over your husband. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And I think that's what we see here. That's what we see here. Is that here, this woman uh, uh, it receives, it says, there is peace between Job and the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. So her husband is aligned with this foreign, wicked king. 
In verse 18, And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. So there's a presumption there, of course, that's given that Sisera is going to find, you know, safe harbor here in this household because he knows this is the household of Heber the Kenite. He's aligned with Jabin, the king of Hazor. So we've got a friendly place we can stay. So that's the presumption that happens here. Verse 19, and he said to her, please give me a little water to drink. And here's where that wonderful feminine wiles start to come in just a little bit here. For I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk, not water, and gave him a drink and covered him up. Now, has anybody ever had trouble sleeping and you had that wonderful glass of, of sort of warm milk and it helped settle you down and put you into like a nice little uh, sleep or stupor? So here's a guy who's already parched, he's already tired and all of these things. She gives him some milk instead of water and what's he do? He goes to sleep. Okay? It's intentional. She did it on purpose. At least I believe she did. Verse 20. And she said to her, and he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was laying fast asleep from weariness. I love this last little piece. So he died. <laughs> In case you didn't get that from, you don't generally live through it with a tent peg going through your temple, right? So he died. And by the way, man, Judges is such a cool book. <laughs> Last week we had blood and guts and intestines spilling out. And this week we got a pe tent peg going through the skull. And uh, what man doesn't want to be married to a woman like this? You know, a woman who's ready to take a tent peg and put it through the skull of a guy if she needs to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so just awesome stuff. Uh, I love it. I love this. Her faithfulness to God superseded her faithfulness to her husband. Okay. And in this case, in this case, okay? And, and I think that that's an important lesson that we need to learn here. That, that we have been called to be obedient to the Lord God in the way that he has ordered all of creation. And in the order that he's given to men, and women, and children in the roles that we've been called to play. But those happen only according to um, our own personal uh, devotion to the Lord. Okay? That if, if, as I mentioned, if a government, a husband, a parent teaches somebody to go or commands somebody to go against what God's word specifically says. We must obey God. We must obey God. And I think the other thing we see here is a very similar situation to the, uh, the midwives, the Hebrew midwives, don't we? That there's an intentional deception that's going on here. An intentional deception that's going on. Yet Jael is lauded, I think, for her faithfulness in the midst of this, even though there was an intentional deception, just like there was with the Hebrew midwives. Which tells us that in the law, and I, th it was, I think it was Luther that came up with this idea of this law of competing absolutes. Like, it's always wrong to lie. It's always wrong to lie. Except when it butts up against another absolute, which is always wrong to murder. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, but so we see we see here that in this law sort of of complete competing absolutes that it's better to lie to, to, to you know, the, the obvious example that always comes up is the whole um, Holocaust, right? If the Nazis came to your door and you were keeping Jews alive in your basement and they asked you, are there any Jews here? Um, you know, would you be permissible to say, nope, no Jews here and lie to them in order to preserve their life? Or are you in sin by not telling them? the truth or something along those lines. And I think that from passages such as this, the Hebrew midwife's passage, things like that, it's better to preserve life, even if you have to be dishonest in those situations. Okay? Now, don't take that and run with it. Okay? Don't go crazy with that, because we need to be sure that we're doing so only according to situations such as that. Okay? We must, not, we must be known as people of the truth. We must be known as people who are not liars and who are honest and full of integrity. So don't hear me saying anything like that because we have been called to be truthful. But when you're in a situation where you are out of all options, I think that we see sometimes 
those situations happen and we've been called to preserve life over and above. All right. Verse 22, And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went to her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So Deborah's prophecy indeed comes true, doesn't it? That it was through a woman that the glory was given and not through Barak. Why? Because Barak didn't step up. He didn't step up, and so he lost the glory because of it. He lost the blessing, and it was passed on to another. And we praise God for the faithfulness of Jael, and a great picture that she is of faithfulness to the Lord, an uncompromising faithfulness in the midst of, of even, I mean, how hard is it to go against your husband on something like this, women? I mean, that'd be a hard thing to do. Be a hard thing to do. And she was faithful even in that moment. Husbands? Um, when you're acting a fool and your wife has to call you out on something or help you or protect you from doing something really dumb, don't, don't berate her. Don't come down harshly on her. Listen to her. She might be calling you out on something that you need to look at yourself and say, mm, yeah, she's right. I was wrong about this. Believe it or not, in my household, I'm wrong a lot. And, and I, I, and, but you know what's great is Katie's never mean or crazy about it or anything like that. She's always gracious. And she's always beautifully submissive in all of these things. It's great. Verse 23, On that day God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So God gives the ultimate deliverance. And they fulfill all the things that God said. That they would. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. A great and awesome picture of how God used mighty women uh, uh, for His glory and brought about the full uh, um, deliverance of His people in the midst of this terrible oppression that had come upon them. But in all of these things, a great reminder that the true warrior, the one who brought the deliverance there, was the Lord God Himself. In John chapter 15, and I'll close with this, Jesus reminds us of the fact that He is the vine and we are the branches. And a few verses down the way, He says, And apart from Me, you can do nothing. One of my favorite quotes from uh, Sproul, who I think was quoting it from Luther, I think, was uh, that, that nothing is not a little something. And it's a reminder of the fact that we ought to remember that all of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ, as His people, are all because of who He is, not because of us. That the strength that even Deborah had in her ability to prophesy and for Jael to remain faithful, that came through God's leading. That came through God's providential hand. The strength for Barak to finally raise up and be a man and, and, and go to battle was because of God's leading. The deliverance that was given of the people into the hand of Israel was all because of what God had done and through sending the rain and the storm and the deliverance that came. And all of our salvation and all who we are in following after Christ is all because of what God has done. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. And so I want us to re- be reminded of this and all of these things, that the, the, the providential hand that you see in all of these things were all because of the work of God that He was doing. That also tells us to trust Him in all aspects of things, even when we have to do the things that are hard. Even when we have to go against the husband or the wife or something like that because we're in disagreement, but we've got to be faithful in all of these things. To remember that God's sovereign in all of it. That He's called us to be faithful um, in the midst and knowing that He is sovereign over all things. And if we are faithful, even when it seems like there, I can't see the deliverance that's coming, I can't see what's going to happen, but I'm going to be faithful, faithful regardless of what may be the consequences. Because I know that God's sovereign over this and He's called me to do so. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you, God, and we thank you for your goodness and grace and mercy that you have given to us. We thank you for the blessing uh, of this incredible passage of Scripture that teaches us, Lord, that you are our fighter, God. You are our warrior. You are our king. 
that Jesus, you even said uh, through the book of Revelation to, to John, that you come riding on a white horse with a sword ready to conquer and destroy, and you are, you are the, 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 the chief warrior, uh, God. You are the Lord of hosts. The Lord of the armies of the, the the King of the armies of the Lord, and all of these things, God, that you are, you are the one who conquers, and we thank you, God, that through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we enter into your incredible conquering. That through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. It says in, in Romans, Lord, and so help us to see you and your sovereign hand in all of these things, Lord. Father, as we have investigated this passage of Scripture, I pray for a number of things. Number one, that we would not hang our faithfulness or salvation on some teacher or some uh, leader or some man or woman, but God, that, I, that, that we would look to you and you alone for, for, and be faithful regardless of our situation. As we saw as Ehud died, that the people turned right back to their own, their old wickedness, Lord. Help us to not be similar. Help us to be faithful to you regardless of who's in power or, or what leader we find ourselves behind. Leaders fall and leaders die, and, and, and Lord, we ought not to put too much hope in man, but put all of our hope in you. Help us, Lord, to be faithful men and women strong, godly men and women who will walk according to the roles and the assignments and the, the ways that you have created us and help us to be faithful in all of those things, knowing that you've knit together a beautiful harmony, Lord, with men and women, and you've called us each to go according to how you've commanded us in the scriptures. Father, I pray that, that the men of this church would be strong leaders and providers, protectors, Lord. And I pray that the women would, would be submissive and obedient and, and that, that, Lord, in all of these cases that you would see a beautiful harmony that you've created for us in the roles that you've commanded us to walk in, Lord. More than anything, God, I'd love to see men loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. For Jesus, you came and you gave yourself for us, Lord, and you loved us even even when we were unlovable. <laughs> and lastly, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to walk in faithfulness as we depart from this place today. And if there's anything in our lives today that is displeasing to you, give us grace, Lord, to repent and uh, help us to be faithful to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.